This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Hey everyone, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I turn some cheap dollar store birdhouses into awesome looking tabletop terrain. So you know those cheap, crappy birdhouses a lot of stores have that no bird would ever live in? You know, the kind that are really just meant to have kids paint them and then get thrown away? Well, if you want a quick, durable foundation for a miniature gaming house, these are a pretty good option. On their own, the shapes are pretty simple and childish looking, but if you combine them, you can create a much more interesting house shape. The first step is to cut off all the unnecessary junk, like the rope hangers and the little dowel perches. And when it comes to cutting these up, they're usually made of the cheapest, thinnest plywood, so they're pretty easy to cut with a handsaw. And if you go that route, I suggest a decent flush cut saw. But if you're like me and you don't wanna waste time, a much more efficient option is a multi-tool if you have one. They make quick work of the plywood and allow for flush cuts. Some areas, straight cuts, you can even get away with scoring with a utility knife and snapping, although it's not ideal. Whatever tool you use is fine. It's just gonna affect how long it takes. So if you don't have a multi-tool like this, but you have a bit more time, just cut with a little handsaw. The goal here is to find a way to fit the various structures together to create an overall form that is more interesting and realistic looking. This means cutting off a bunch of overhangs in order to place things close together and fit them tightly. Play around with different layout ideas and cut as needed. Eventually, a good shape will start to form. Wood glue is going to be your strongest option for assembly, but it doesn't bond right away. And if you wanna keep working immediately, you need something that's gonna tack it in place instantly. So leave a little room for some hot glue, and that will hold things together until the wood glue dries. All of the big holes on any of the surfaces can be covered with some construction paper glued right to the plywood. And if you have an area like I ended up with here that needed a stronger material to fix the missing bottom, just use some medium weight chipboard or cardboard or foam core. I also used chipboard to complete the roof where two separate buildings intersected. This would ensure I had a nice strong and flat surface to apply shingles to later. I wanted to decorate the base of the building with brickwork, but I didn't wanna to go to the tedious task of applying individual foam bricks, although I do love that method. I wanted to see if my caulking and roller method that I've used on other stuff previously would work well to create a thin, texture strip that I could apply to the structure. I spread some Dynaflex caulking onto construction paper and rolled it out with a wet textured rolling pin and then left it to dry, which did take several hours. But once dry, I was able to easily cut this into strips at whatever height I wanted. This resulted in very thin and flexible strips that had a paper backing that would be easy to glue to various surfaces. And I made way more than I needed for this one project because these could be saved for future builds and be ready to go when needed. At first, I cut individual pieces per side, but I realized that it was actually thin and flexible enough to be bent around and into corners so that you could have continuous pieces without seams. This was a huge bonus, making this method even better. So to those of you who asked if you could do something like this when I was making roads, the answer is yes, and you should, it's great. The next step was the timber strips. Again, many ways to approach this, but my favorite is taking a big block of XPS foam, scratching in wood grain with a wire brush, and then ripping it into thin strips at the thickness I want. If you don't have a foam cutter, you could use EVA craft foam sheets that are already thin or Dollar Tree foam core with the paper removed. Another option is wood coffee stir sticks. With this method, you can cut strips of timber at whatever width you need and apply all over the building to finish off all the edges and corners. But before I moved on to the rest of the decorative timber, I placed my windows and doors. And in this case, I opted for ready to use MDF cut ones from shiftinglands.com. You can buy these from them for really cheap and they are a great resource, totally worth it. But if you wanna be more frugal, I have plenty of old videos where I hand craft doors and windows in various methods that you could try. As I placed the windows, I also worked on the wood trim work around them. With all of the woodwork in place, it was time to create a stucco texture. 
Again, I've done this so many different ways in the past and even have videos dedicated to just testing and comparing different methods. All are fine. This time around, I opted to just brush on some more of that Dynaflex caulking because I already had it out. I applied it very thin and then stippled it with a brush to give it a uniform texture. Some inevitably will get onto the wood strips, but that can easily be wiped off with a damp brush or finger. At this point, it's time for the most time consuming part of the process, which is the shingles. Thankfully, I came up with a really cool and efficient way to do this. But before I get into that, I wanna tell you about this video's sponsor, Squarespace. My existing website is horribly outdated. I haven't properly updated it in months, realistically years. And that's because the platform that I've been using to create and host it is really cumbersome, not very intuitive and lacks tools to do a bunch of the stuff I want. So I avoid the task of updating entirely and kind of just let my website rot, which is terrible as a content creator. That's why when Squarespace reached out to work with me, I jumped on the opportunity because I've been wanting to switch my website to their platform for a long time. And now is the perfect time to do it. And I have started slowly transitioning my website to their platform. Squarespace is gonna work a lot better for me because it has a lot of tools that I need in a website. It's not even that they'd be better for me and what I need, it's just that they have a lot more features, meaning they're better for a wide variety of people. Personally, I'm excited to use their integrated store so that I can control my own web store on my own website instead of doing it elsewhere. And even better is that their web store tool can integrate with the square payment method, which I'm gonna be using when I start to attend conventions selling Idols of Torment. Maybe you want to sell your crafts, your terrain, your miniatures. So you're gonna need a place to do that that's gonna have a gallery, a store, and just an overall good experience for the web user. And Squarespace is gonna be a great way for you to set up that website and start making money that can fund your hobby. So if you're wanting to do that, go to squarespace.com and sign up for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blackmagiccraft to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Link's gonna be in the description. So I've done shingles a number of different ways in the past. Usually I'll use something like cereal box and hand cut either individual shingles or strips of them and apply them to the structure. I've also done some using foam where I cut a block of foam with my proxon and then cut the shingle shape into it and then cut it into thin strips and apply it to the building. Those methods are all fine and they look really good, but they are very time consuming. So for this build, I decided to test out a new machine that I bought for a different hobby, but I knew would be useful for terrain making, my Cricut Cutter. I had to first design a cut pattern for the machine to use. So I made one shingle shape in Photoshop and then laid that out in multiples as a strip that I could then save as a PNG with no background and import to Cricut Design Studio. This shape would be converted to a cut pattern that I could then lay out a bunch of to fit the material I had, which in this case was still cereal box from the recycling bin. Now this was certainly a lot easier than cutting by hand. It allowed for much smaller and more uniform shingles, but it still wasn't that fast. It took the Cricut quite a while to cut these, but the good thing is that I could do other stuff while it was working on them. And since I didn't have to hand cut them, I could be a bit more attentive when applying them to the actual roof. Like I didn't feel inclined to space them wider than I should in order to use and need to make less. I could just cut more and more as needed without much effort. To do this whole building, it actually took the front and back panels of two cereal boxes, which meant four runs through the Cricut cutter. But I always had one cut going while I was gluing the previous strip, so it was a very efficient task, and it made it a lot more tolerable and, dare I say, enjoyable. No matter how you cut your shingle strips, I suggest running them wild when applying. Then wait for the glue to dry and cut off all the excess. The ridges can be capped with individual shingles or with strips of paper folded in half. Both will look good once painted, but one is obviously easier. I was very happy with how these shingles looked, easily the best I've ever done, and I was glad that this house didn't look like it was built from a birdhouse frame. It looked like a proper design, 
I approach painting this one a bit differently. I started with a black primer through an airbrush. I considered just black bombing it with rattle can primer, but I found that that can react poorly with oil washes and paint thinners. So if there's any chance that I want to use oil washes on a piece, I prefer to go with an acrylic primer. And instead of Zenithal highlight with white ink like I often do, I moved directly into paint with a light beige. I slowly built up the color of the stucco, walls, and timber. Then I switched to an off-white, which I applied only to the sections of stucco, trying my best to avoid the wood strips. I like doing this where there is room for error when it's pretty forgiving as it's a good time to practice airbrush control without much risk of messing things up. For the stone, I added a splotchy coat of a very greenish dark gray. I didn't go for a solid coverage with this. Instead, I wanted some variation in the undertone on the stonework to help it feel more realistic. For the roof tiles, I went with a very deep red. This again was an opportunity to practice airbrush control, trying not to get the red onto any of the walls, but this was pretty difficult to avoid. So I did have to touch up the walls a bit, which led to me having a bit of overspray of white on the roof. I didn't think I could get things much better than this with the airbrush, so I just did final touch-ups with a brush by hand to get sharper transitions. I used some white craft paint to dry brush on some highlights on the stonework, and then played around with some pan pastels, using some red and orange on the roof just to give it a bit more tonal variation. Then I mixed up a brown oil wash and went over all the wood, as well as the edges where it met the stucco. And at first I was just gonna keep to the wood areas, but I felt like it would be best to also hit the stonework and the roof. I had mixed this wash pretty thin, didn't have a lot of pigment in it, so it didn't dirty things up too much. Applying the wash to these other areas just helped tie all the different surfaces together and give things a bit more of a unified look, and it would fill any nooks and crannies that my paint had missed. The final step to finishing things off was some green pan pastels to simulate, you know, a bit of light moss and mildew. Pan pastels really shine here because they allow you to do a very subtle application, which looks great for a more realistic thin layer of mildew buildup in low spots and corners. And that's that. A couple of cheap birdhouses, some caulking, paper, foam, cereal boxes simple paint job, and I'm left with a great looking townhouse for D&D or Mordheim or whatever tabletop games I might want to use it for. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to hit the like button and drop me a comment. It really helps. And if you want to support the channel further, you can do so by shopping for your supplies on my essential equipment page on blackmagiccraft.ca or by supporting the channel on Patreon. Love you all, and I'll see you again next time. Cheers and happy crafting.